The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Now joining us, like we said before the break, we have uh, uh, Vic Faisal. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Alan. It's good to be on your show, and, and you too, Mike. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, we're super excited to talk to you today, Vic. Now, Vic, um, now, 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 what happened to you in this whole whole scenario um, in the Confessions Killer that we watched on Netflix? Um, were you surprised about how your your whole life went and turned from this this thing? I was surprised. I really was when when I was a, a young DA. I was still rather naive about how powerful people can just take control and do what they want to without any accountability. I didn't realize who I was up against. We didn't have Google back then, so I couldn't Google Colonel Jim Adams. Uh, who was back then head of the state police, uh, head of the Texas Rangers. Today I could Google him and see his background and know what I was up against. But back then I had no idea. I was so naive. Uh, today I know that Colonel Jim Adams learned his craft at the, at the feet of J. Edgar Hoover. He had been deputy director of the FBI under Hoover. While he was under Hoover, he was, uh, he was head of the domestic spy program. That's the program that spies on American citizens, back then mainly war protesters and civil rights activists. Uh, it was the domestic spy program that hid the tape recorder under Martin Luther King's bed and then tried to get him to either drop out of public life or commit suicide. They gave him an ultimatum, some like 30 days, and that was traced back to the domestic spy program. I learned a lot later about some of their techniques disinformation, intimidation, isolation. And when I pissed off Jim Adams, when I made Jim Adams mad, uh, they came after me with every kind of cloak and dagger technique that they had used when he was head of the domestic spy program. And it shocked me. It really did. Uh, what I had seen was something going on with these Lucas Confessions. Uh, he had confessed to three in McLennan County, Waco, where I am, where I was DA. And to me, it was obvious he hadn't done them. One, we had a really good suspect on. He had already said he was going to confess to it if we convicted him on a companion crime. But while that was going on, Lucas confessed, and then he shut up. We did convict him on the companion crime. It was, he had been... Uh, kidnapping prostitutes from East Waco, taking them out in the woods, raping them, and then stabbing them. Uh, so we got a life sentence on him. Then Lucas confessed to Rita Salazar, a young girl who had been kidnapped with her boyfriend just north of Austin when they ran out of gas. The boyfriend was killed in, near Round Rock, just north of Austin. But Rita was brought up here to uh, just outside of Waco was raped and then shot numerous times and left in a ditch near the highway. So my county had jurisdiction there. I wanted to see the confessions because I had been seeing this Lucas on TV saying things like, you know, my M.O. is that I just never leave any evidence. That's my M.O. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, Freddy Krueger couldn't do that. So when he confessed to Rita Salazar, I wanted to see the confessions. That's when I found out there were two confessions, one from Lucas and then one from Otis Tool, who had confessed from uh, Jacksonville, Florida. He was in prison in Florida. In one of the confessions, Tool said he shot her. In the other confession, Lucas said he shot her. And Lucas also claimed that Frida Powell and Frank Powell uh, two little kids, 10 and 12 years old, had been in the car with them helping restrain Rita. Well, we were able to get their school records. They were in school that day in Florida, so there wasn't any, re any way these two little bitty kids were helping to commit a murder. And it just bothered me. And that's when I started looking off into it. 
thinking that if I found something, the state police would be willing to look at it and clean up their own backyard. Well, they weren't. They came after me instead. Well, well so, so how do you explain that uh, in the sense of um, if we all are looking for justice, um, state police, Texas Rangers, and you, um, why... I mean, I have my opinion, but why, why would they come after you if you're just helping them solve crimes? Well, the problem was I wasn't helping them solve crimes. I was proving that the crimes they had already solved, they had done it wrong. Our grand jury, I called together a grand jury to see how is Lucas confessing to all these crimes he couldn't possibly have committed. And I used the three that he had done in our county as a springboard for that investigation. We brought people in from all over the country. Lucas had confessed from all the way from Washington State to, uh, to Florida. He had even tried to confess to some in Japan, he even said he had driven the poison to Jim Jones in Guyana. You know, and it was just ridiculous. And so I, we compiled all this information. And I took it down to Colonel Jim Adams. We were just talking about him. He was head of the state police. And by then, I had the Texas Attorney General helping me. He had assigned two lawyers to me to help. One of them was actually the lawyer for the state police. And he was in the room with me when I showed Jim Adams what we had and said, see here, there's no way that Lucas committed. And by then, I had maybe 30 that he couldn't possibly have committed. I said, there's no way he committed these crimes, and I have doubts about most of the others. I said, if you will clean up your own backyard, reopen these cases, talk to your task force, give them some rules and regulations and clean this mess up. I'll, I'll shut my grand jury down because I really don't want to be doing this. I don't want to be as a black guy. And by then, he was already so mad at me because of some things I had said on TV. He looked at me. He pushed the papers back across the desk at me. He stuck his finger toward my face. And he says, we're not reopening a single Henry Lucas case. I'm not looking at the task force, but I am going to investigate you. And man, a shiver went up my spine because he said it, and he said it mean. He, he, he was a mean guy. I mean, he was the 70s state police version of Darth Vader. He should have had background music up into a room. Uh, the lawyer for or the state police, he warned me. He said, keep your mouth shut until we're out of the building. Because even he thought the building was bugged. And uh, that's when they started investigating me. They did not like being questioned. The Texas Rangers are a cult of glory. They have all these legends, and most of them we've been looking into. And there's a great book about to come out by a, a guy named Doug Swanson called Cult of Glory. Uh, Viking Publishers. Uh, you can pre-order it now, but it's coming out in June. Uh, they just, man, they'll go to war with you if you if you question them on anything. And I was the only one. Other people around the state, other law enforcement officers around the state, had their doubts about what was going on with Henry Lucas, but no one was willing to say anything. No one was willing to do anything until I stepped up and said, no, we have to do something about this. We have to do what's right. We cannot let this fraud be perpetrated on the family members of the victims. We can't let this fraud be perpetrated on our justice system. It, it just wasn't right to me, so I felt that somebody had to do something. And nobody had. One lady from Dallas, she was a police officer in Dallas, she's on the, the confession killer. Uh, they interviewed her. She put together a fake report, fake pictures, fake autopsy report, everything. Took it down, uh, went through the procedure how she was supposed to, and Lucas confessed to it. He got a lot of it right. And, you know, how that happened? You know, how that happened? Uh, and what did she do with that information? She went back to Dallas, and she told her supervisors, and they says, well, the Dallas police isn't going to take any more uh, Lucas confessions. But they didn't go public with it. They didn't tell their DA about it. Uh, they didn't tell Jim Adams about it. They sat on it, man. 
because they were not willing to cross that thin blue line to violate the law enforcement brotherhood. But somebody had to, guys. And I finally figured out it had to be me. I was, I was the tipping point. I was at that place. Now, Hugh Ainsworth, I found out about him later. He was a, a journalist in Dallas with the Dallas Times Herald. And he was working on this article about Lucas because he had gone down and talked with Lucas early on. And uh, he had figured out that there wasn't any way Lucas had done this. So he started traveling the country, finding out where Lucas was. That, like during the Orange Sox case that Lucas got the death penalty for. Hugh Ainsworth found the documents that proved that he was in Jacksonville, Florida on that day, selling scrap metal. He had to sign when he sold it. And then he went across the street and cashed the check. And he had to sign the back of the check. And that was on the day of the Orange Sox murder. So Hugh had put together this huge article uh, about this Lucas fiasco. And I found out what, what was going on when I mentioned to a friend of mine who was writing a book about a murder case I had tried. And I told him what we were looking into in Lucas. And he says, oh, man, you need to meet Hugh Ainsworth. So I did and found out they were about to publish that article. So I asked Hugh if he and the Times Herald would hold off and not publish it just yet because we wanted to get Henry Lucas away from the task force. And I knew if that article came out, we wouldn't get Lucas, even with a court order. They'd fight us up through the courts and keep him confessing every day for another year. And then, you know, Hugh's story would have been yesterday's news, and they'd still be getting plaques and chrome-plated shotguns and dinners and all the things they were getting. Uh, so the Dallas Times-Herald agreed. Uh, we got a bench warrant, which is a court order for them to turn Lucas over to us. And when we got Lucas away from them, Hugh Ainsworth was one of our first witnesses before the grand jury, and he laid all that information he had gathered out in front of the grand jury. And then the day after that was when the Dallas Times-Herald published that article, and then it just went crazy after that. So Hugh Ainsworth is a big hero of mine, and I think the world of him. But if I hadn't had that grand jury, if I hadn't been calling them on the carpet legally, uh, because I was the only law enforcement officer willing to do it. I'm afraid Hugh's article would have become yesterday's news. Henry would have kept confessing. Henry would have eventually been executed, and they would have gotten away with this fraud. Uh, wow. So now, how long was it before you had 19 agents um, coming to your house and office and arresting you and uh, and and what was it that they were trying to arrest you on? They wanted to arrest me for anything. They investigated me for everything possible. Anybody that got arrested in this county, they'd go to them and say, hey, if you can tell us something on Vic Fazell, we'll make your problems go away. Now, Jim Adams brought the FBI in on me. They investigated me for two or three months. This started in uh, 1985 while the grand jury was going on. Our grand jury was in uh, March and April of 1985. But see, the Justice Department has a, has a policy that if they go in and investigate a public official and they can't find anything after a while, they have to fold up their tents and go home. Well, that's what they did. They couldn't find anything on me because I hadn't done anything my whole life except work. I didn't even have a passport. I worked my way through college. I worked my way through law school. I was faithful to my wife. I didn't do drugs. I, I couldn't even afford to play golf. The only exercise I got was mowing my own yard. So after a couple months, they folded up and went home. However, there's a caveat to that policy, and that is unless there's a public outcry. Well, Jim Adams got that public outcry for him. He contacted a, a Republican party operative named Paul, uh, Pawkin, Tom Pawkin. Not sure what he did for the Republican Party. I know he was on their payroll, and he would do errands for them. He, he was a muckety-muck in the Republican Party until he got crossways with uh, Karl Rove and George Bush uh, when Bush was running for president. But he's the one who got Channel 8 to come in and do 
these investigative uh, reports on me. They accused me of everything under the sun. Our congressman said they're accusing that Vic Fazell of everything except sex with a dead boy or, uh, yeah, sex with a dead girl or a live boy. That's what he said. <laughs> and that's about it. They were accusing me of everything. Uh, and they still couldn't find anything. But this reporter was going around to my barber shop, to restaurants where I ate. Uh, people I knew were starting to get subpoenaed to the grand jury. So disinformation, remember I mentioned that before, disinformation, intimidation, isolation. So they started with the disinformation, Charles Duncan with these 11 episodes about me that weren't true. And he started that during our grand jury to try to derail our grand jury. I had grand jurors asking me about, well, what's this I'm hearing on the street about you being investigated? And I'd tell them, they're just trying to derail this grand jury. We're up against some pretty powerful people here. I didn't realize at the time, I had never heard the phrase at the time, deep state, but I was the victim of a deep state conspiracy which was headed up by Colonel Jim Adams because he had the contacts, he had the budget, and he could get whatever done he wanted done. Remember, he had been head of the domestic spy program under J. Edgar Hoover. So, so there's, they ran four grand juries on me before they ever got me indicted. They subpoenaed everybody I knew. They were trying to accuse me of taking bribes. They were accusing me of being involved in drug rings. They are accusing me of being soft on, uh, on uh, cases that involved uh, assaults on police officers. Matter of fact, the only thing they said was true was about a, an assault on a police officer that was dismissed, but that wasn't me. That was my predecessor. That was the guy I had beat in the election. And that was the only thing they got right, but they, they got my name wrong. Uh, they said it, was, it wasn't. So, man, I was up against all kinds of stuff here. And then there was a federal judge here named Walter Smith. He's not on the bench anymore, but he hated me because I had helped campaign for his uh, opponent when he was a state district judge and he was defeated but then we got a Republican governor who appointed him who got who pulled some strings and got him appointed to the federal bench here well Walter Smith was the one who was really pushing to get me indicted he wanted me out of office Jim Adams wanted me out of office because I had embarrassed him and the Texas Rangers when I went on TV and said I thought they were doing something if it wasn't illegal it was at least unethical, that's when all hell broke loose. And that's when they came after me like crazy. So they still couldn't find anything on me, uh, Alan. So what they did next was they brought in the IRS. And the IRS investigated every criminal defense lawyer in McLennan County. All of them. They pretty much shut down the criminal justice system here. And they found four lawyers with tax problems, and they offered them immunity if they would say they gave me part of that money to dismiss or go easy on one of their cases. Most all of them were DWI cases. Well, guys, I wasn't the only person in the DA's office. I had 13 assistants working for me. I was trying the biggest, baddest murder cases. I wasn't trying DWIs. But they were making these cases on me for dismissing or going easy on DWIs. The grand jury still wouldn't indict me. The grand jury that indicted me, all they saw were the Duncan tapes, those 11 defamatory episodes about me that Channel 8 had done. And they were sponsored by Jim Adams' right-hand man, a guy named Ron Border. He's the one who had been assigned full-time to investigate me from that meeting I had with uh, Jim Adams in his office when he said, I'm not opening a single Lucas case, but I am investigating you. Well, that was, uh, that was uh, Ron Border that he assigned, and then they put an FBI agent with him. And uh, when it got down to it, they showed those tapes to a grand jury even the U.S. attorney committed perjury in front of the grand jury. That's how deep this deep state thing goes. One of the grand jurors asked her, and I have this testimony. I was able to get it when I sued Channel 8 uh, later. When you're, when you're looking at doing life in prison, you get almost no discovery. 
You sue somebody for $10,000, man, you can find out everything about them. So it was after we got into the civil case that I was able to get the grand jury transcripts. And one of the grand jurors asked, why would this Dallas reporter be so interested in this DA from Waco 90 miles away? And the U.S. attorney spoke up and said, I don't think this witness knows anything about that. Well, that witness did know something about it, and she knew he knew something about it because she had been in the meeting in Georgetown the night that we got Henry Lucas away from the task force. There's a big meeting that's been called the Big Brass Meeting. Jim Adams was assistant U.S. attorney was there. The task force was there. A guy named Greg Rampton with the FBI was there, and Google Greg Rampton sometimes. Boy, besides what he did to me, he planted false evidence in my house. So after he was caught doing that during the trial, he was transferred. The next time he got in trouble was when Jerry Spence was cross-examining him uh, about Ruby Ridge. And come to find out, he was the FBI agent who had rearranged evidence before photographing it at Ruby Ridge. And we all know about Ruby Ridge and what they did at Ruby Ridge. And some of the same ones that were at Ruby Ridge then got sent back to Waco and were involved in burning down the Davidians. So I'm telling you, there's a small group of powerful, mean people that are doing some awful stuff, and they ought to be shut down. Now, most of these guys are now retired or dead, but there are younger ones that have taken their place, and this kind of stuff still goes on. If you don't think it does... Uh, there's a good movie out now on Amazon called The Report about Senator Feinstein's investigation of the torture that was going on at Guantanamo and the deep state involvement in trying to shut down her committee, even trying to set up uh, one of her investigators and trying to accuse him of a crime the same way they accused me of a crime by planting false evidence. No. So, I, I was naive. I did not know the magnitude of the people I was up against. But I used one of their own sayings against them. So I said, the Rangers have a saying, you can't stop a man in the right who keeps on a coming. Well, they're up against them. And I, I would not back down. I kept pushing it. I kept pushing it. Thank God for my attorney, Gary Richardson. Uh, he had been a former U.S. attorney himself. He defended me in the criminal case. I was found not guilty on the first vote. The jury held a press conference and said, we're convinced the government was trying to frame this young man. So then we, we pursued the case that I had already filed against Channel 8, Below because I wanted to be proven innocent. A lot of people were saying, well, the government just didn't meet their burden of proof. You know, they had gotten these four guys to say they had given me this money to dismiss these cases. And I had assistant DAs come in and explain Vic didn't even know this case was in the office. I dismissed this case, and here's the reasons I dismissed it. And uh, so then we went after Belo because I didn't want him saying, well, the government just didn't meet their burden of proof. They couldn't prove he was guilty. So as a public official, I had to take the burden of proof on myself and prove that every single word they said in those 11 episodes, and those 11, 11 episodes included the, the uh, bribery allegations that I had gone to trial on. So I had to take the burden of proof myself and march them back across their own goal line. And not only did I have to prove what they said was false and defamatory, but as a public official, I had to prove they did it with malice, and we did that. We got a $58 million verdict, the largest libel verdict in the history of the United States. I'm in the Guinness Book of World Records for that. But, as I said, Lynette <laughs> left out that they said, well, we couldn't put him in prison, but we're not going to let him keep that money. They changed the tax code five years later, made it retroactive to scoop me up in it, hit me with all kinds of penalties and interest and everything, and I ended up having to sell nearly everything I had and go back to work. But at least I proved my innocence. I stood up in front of that jury after the verdict, and I said, Your Honor, there's something I want to say. I want to thank 24 very special people. I want to thank the 12 in Austin who found me not guilty. 
And I want to thank the 12 here today who found me innocent. And uh, that was it. Mm. And we we uh, mm. we that case just short of uh, short of the appeal for right at 15 million dollars. My lawyer and I split it right down the middle because even though I had done a whole lot of the work on, on both the criminal case and the civil case, he took a chance on me. He represented me for free on the even paid his own expenses. My phone was ringing. It turned out. <laughs> he paid his own expenses. So, uh, so we split that right down the middle. He paid taxes on his because it was a legal fee. But back then, uh, libel verdicts, personal libel verdicts, were not taxable. It was considered like a personal injury, like getting your arm cut off. Because even after all of that, 30 years later, even after Netflix, there are people in this town who say, still say Vic Fazell's a crook just because it was beat into their heads so much, you know? So, mm. Yeah, that's the way libel works, right? That's the way libel works, but now it's taxable. Now they say, no, nope, it's taxable. They, they caught up several people in that, but I was the only one with that big a settlement. I think the next biggest to me was either thirty or 50000 So it was definitely me they were after, and that was another deep stake tactic, just to, to punish me for what I had done and to send a message to everyone else out there in law enforcement that you do not violate the law enforcement brotherhood. Here's a quick story that will emphasize what I'm talking about. Right after the grand jury started, I got a call from the district attorney in Bell County. That's the neighboring county here. He had been a friend of mine for years. He said, Vic, I've got some information for you. I need to talk to you. I said, well, tell me, Cappy. He said, no, I need for you to come down here. I said, oh, man. His name was Cappy Ead. So I got in my car. I thought he had some Lucas info for me. I drive down to his office. He makes me wait nearly an hour before bringing me in, which one DA just doesn't do to another. And he sets me down in his office and said, Vic, I got you down here to tell you I can't be your friend anymore. We're just not going to be friends. I said, why, Cappy? He said, well, you violated the law enforcement brotherhood. Right or wrong, you shouldn't have done it, Vic. And because you did it, we're not friends. I said, Cappy, are you recording this? Are you doing this so you can play this to the Rangers and get some points with them? And I was looking around the room for the, the candid camera, you know. Uh, but And I never spoke again. And a whole lot of my friends from law enforcement had the same attitude. We don't care if you were right, Vic. You should have kept your mouth shut. Well, if I'd kept my mouth shut, there are nearly 30 men in prison right now who have been caught because of DNA comparison on cases that Henry Lucas had confessed to. One of them was that case I mentioned earlier, Rita Salazar, uh, the one that the, the little teenage girl that was kidnapped and then raped, shot up here in Waco. That's who I was talking about when they arrested me, and I held my thumbs up and I said, you know what's going on here, and I'll still be proven right. Well, I was talking about Rita Salazar. Well, guys, it took 30 years, but with DNA science, the way it was, and her case being a cold case and not a closed case, because, guys, if, if I had let Henry plead to that, that would have been a closed case, not a cold case. No one would have ever looked at it again. Well, 30 years later, somebody decides, let's go look at the oldest case we've got. It was Rita Salazar. Her underwear was still in a, still in a seal meal bag. They were able to extract DNA from it. They put that DNA in the, the CODIS, the, the DNA bank, and it matched his own sex offender. They went up and they interviewed him. He had just gotten out of prison for another crime, and he confessed, not only to her murder, but also to the murder of her boyfriend, Frank Key. And he confessed without being shown any photographs, without seeing any police reports, without any of the benefit that Lucas had when he confessed, and even though he, he and Otis got it all mixed up and wrong, this guy, his name is Benny Tijarina. He's now serving time in prison for the murder of Rita Salazar. And that would have never happened if I had not dug my heels in and went through what I went through. It was hard. 
But I got to tell you, last month, Jonathan and I got a call from Rita Salazar's sister. She had been mad at me back during that time because I would not let Henry plead to the murder of her sister. When then Governor George Bush commuted Henry's only uh, death sentence, which was to the Hornsox case, the one where Hugh had found that Henry was actually in Jacksonville, uh, she got mad at George Bush. She, she started an organization uh, fighting George Bush when he was running for president for commuting Henry's death sentence. Well, we get a call from her last month, and she's thanking me now. Thank you for mm-hmm. what you Because if you hadn't done that, the real murderer of my little sister would have never been caught. Mm-hmm. It's, it's come full circle. Except for my money. Now, if Congress wants to talk about <laughs> reparations, they ought to do some reparations for me, damn it. Because I, I was victim of a deep state conspiracy. It was just punishment for me doing the right thing. They want to talk about reparations? Hey, let's start with Vic Fazell. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good luck, eh? Uh, now, now, now the, um, after all of this, you went and started representing Lucas and, yep. and in some of these cases. Well, what what can you tell us about that? Well, I didn't want him to get another death penalty. I didn't want him to be convicted of another one because I was thoroughly convinced he hadn't done any of them. I still have my doubts about Kate Rich and Becky Powell. Uh, most experts say he probably killed three, his mom, Kate Rich, and Becky Powell. Well, I've really studied the paperwork on Kate Rich and Becky Powell, and I know who the men were who were involved in that situation. One of them was Ranger Phil Ryan. And on my podcast, The Vic Fazell Show, we've always been very respectful to Phil Ryan until I saw uh, the confession killer and heard him saying things like, well, Vic Fazell had an axe to grind with the Texas Rangers. All he wanted to do was give us a black eye. Well, that's just absolutely not true. Absolutely not true. What I wanted was the truth. And I can't believe that Phil Ryan would still be saying something like that, even with all the evidence that's come out, even with 30 people now being in prison for crimes that Henry had confessed to, thanks to DNA. So what I did was after I got my settlement from Belo, I spent a lot of it traveling around the country representing Henry Lucas to make sure he didn't get convicted again. And you know what? Once I would sit down with the DA and lay out the information I had, a lot of it had been gathered by the grand jury, a lot of it had been gathered by Hugh Ainsworth and laid out that information saying, I can prove that Henry Lucas was a thousand miles away at the time this murder happened. I never had to go to trial. Never. One of them, uh, I had to go to Florida for this one. Henry was accused of killing the father of the sheriff uh, of a small county in Florida. So I flew to Florida. I had to drive like 90 miles from the airport to get to that jail. The jailer takes me back and locks me in the jail with Henry Lucas. And I'm, I'm glad I already knew Henry from before and had spent good time with him from before and knew that he really wasn't dangerous and he really isn't schizophrenic either. Because I had worked with, for MHMR before I became DA, and I had been around a lot of schizophrenics. And I'm telling you, Henry was not schizophrenic. So anyway, they left me locked in that jail from the time I got there until it was getting dark. I didn't know if I was ever going to get out of that jail. But I was able to convince the prosecutor the next day that they didn't have a case here. And I talked with the sheriff, and I said, do you really want to lock somebody up for the murder of your daddy that didn't do it? Or would you rather keep this case open and hopefully find out who really did kill your daddy someday? And I got through to that man. I got to say, I really did, and he, he was very receptive. The DA was receptive. They dismissed that. Another significant case I represented him on was a murder up in Texas. DNA had just come out then, the DNA comparison science. And I said to the DA up there, let's bring Henry to Tyler, stick a needle in his arm and pull out some blood, and let's do some DNA comparisons. Because they had been able to preserve all the evidence from the murder that had happened in Tyler. An elderly woman had been murdered. And they had some DNA samples that they had taken. She had been raped and murdered. Well, it didn't match Henry. Uh, 
years later, and so they dismissed the, that case against Henry. So all the all the DNA that they did on Henry basically came from that blood draw. I was the one who submitted him for his first blood draw for DNA that went into the DNA data banks. Years later, the family starts complaining, are you looking at this cold case? Are you looking at our mom's case? So they go into CODIS, they look some more, and guess what? They find a match. And now they've caught the guy who killed that woman. And in the interim, he had killed another woman and it raped even another woman in front of her two little children. So uh, that's one really dangerous person that's now off the street who would still be out doing this if I hadn't given Henry up for his uh, DNA back then. So yeah, I, I went around and it didn't take very many. I represented them on eight or ten, and after a while, they all just started folding, man. They just started folding. They didn't want anything to do with it because they realized it was all bogus. Yeah. And so cases started being reopened all over the United States back then, which would not have been open, would never have been open, if I hadn't dug my heels in right here in Waco, Texas, and pissed off Jim Adams and uh, got it all started. Because um, nobody in law enforcement was going to stand up to them. Yeah. So Otis Tool, Henry's partner, Lucas's partner, was uh, also notorious for confessing to a lot of murders and one in particular is the uh, more famous case of uh, Adam Walsh um, what are your thoughts on on Otis Toole? well you know the Florida uh, Department of Investigation or whatever their top police are down there a few years ago they finally closed that case out and said yeah it was Otis that did it there's no evidence at all that Otis did that case Quite frankly, there's plenty of evidence that he didn't do it. I do not believe that, that Otis Toole killed Adam Walsh. I don't think Otis Toole ever killed anybody, except maybe one guy he burned up accidentally in a house one time. Uh, no, these, these guys were not serial killers. They just were not. And Otis, he, he never even left, uh, left Florida. He might have taken one quick trip up, up to the Northeast one time. But all this stuff about Otis and Henry being these traveling companions and, and travel thousands of miles to kill this person and then thousand miles the other direction to kill another person, that's all BS. None of yeah. that happened. Those I think that too. Car that rained. I'm sorry. Would you <laughs> I said I, I feel that way too, but uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, the case closed stuff is... <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah. I'd like to look into the Adam Walsh case someday, but you know he's got a very powerful daddy, and yeah. Rob Kent, who directed uh, the Confession Killer, he didn't want to look at that one, just because it, it would have caused some political strife because of Adam's dad being so uh, rich and famous. But no, I do not believe that Otis Tool killed Adam Walsh. Not in a million years. No. Show me some evidence. Show me some proof, not just Otis's confession. Mm. So, so what do you what are you kind of hoping that people get out of uh, out of seeing the confession killers or um, listening to you? Like, what what are they supposed to think about the justice system? Well, I hope what they get is, is don't take anything at face value. If you're going to be on a jury, don't believe that guy's guilty just because he's been indicted. Make them put on their evidence. We live in America where the prosecution has the burden of proof. The defendant can sit nothing. He's innocent until proven guilty. However, in our justice system, when a juror walks in, most of the time the guy in the defendant's chair is presumed guilty until proven innocent. That's not our Constitution. It shouldn't be that way. And I'm asking all of our citizens to take law enforcement and hold their feet to the fire. Make them up the evidence and make them prove it to you beyond a reasonable doubt. And don't believe it just because somebody in power says it. That's what I'm hoping for. And I'm also hoping that, that Netflix will wake up and do a season two because they've already done all the, all the filming. They've got enough for a second episode. 
about the deep state versus Vic Fazell. People need to know what happened to me because it can happen to you. You piss off the wrong people. You make the wrong people angry. It can happen to you. There are so many powerful people in some of these agencies like the FBI and the CIA and some of these subcontractors who have limitless budgets, limitless power, and no accountability. They can thumb their nose at the U.S. Senate, just like they did Feinstein and just like Jim Adams did the Senate committee that was investigating the domestic spy program. He basically thumbed their nose at them. He told them, we have at least 8 million files on American citizens. And the way he looked at them, and we, we've got copies of that video. The way he looked at them, he was sending them the message, I've got files on you. So all they did was slap him on the wrist, and a few years later, he was able to export all his cloak and dagger stuff to the state of Texas. And then I was one of the first people that he used it on. Now, he was eventually taken out of DPS by the DPS board because they started seeing the pattern. He did it, not only did it to me, he did it to a county attorney in, uh, in West Texas, and he did it to a sheriff in South Texas, and they started seeing the pattern. He resigned from office about a week before I went to trial because I think they knew in their hearts they were never going to be able to convict me. They just wanted me to have to take the ride. Now, i got to tell you, I was kind of scared, because when you're looking at 80 years and you're up against the power of the government, you got to take that seriously. I'd already made my wife promise that if I was found guilty that she would get a divorce and try to move on with her life. Uh, Jan Patterson, the U.S. attorney, had bragged publicly that Dick Fazell would be enjoying the snows of Leavenworth by Christmas, and the only time he'll ever see his little boy will be through a thick glass. Well, those are threats that, that get to you, you know. They, they, they'll, they'll scare you some, and it scared me. That's but nasty. It was, it was na they were so nasty to me. And that's why I wish Netflix would do a second season. I mean, they, they did good in what they got, but they dropped the ball by not going forward with it. They haven't told the rest of the story. They haven't tied the ends together. And they've already done all the work. All they got to do is edit it. They interviewed me for like six solid days, uh, some in Austin, some in Waco, and then they flew me out to L.A. twice. They interviewed a lot of other people who can add to this story and open people's eyes about what the government can do to you if they get mad at you. So I'm really hoping that if, if Robert Ken Kenner doesn't want to do it, because I know he's moved on to bigger and better things now. I mean, when this started out, it was going to be 10 episodes. Then he had to turn down the documentary RGB, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I could tell that bothered him. And then he was offered another big one. I'm not going to mention the name because he may be under a non-disclosure and he may not have told, should have told me about it. But it's a big documentary, and he wanted that one. So suddenly it went from 10 episodes to, oh, Vic, it's just going to be eight. And then it's going to be six. And I found out the week before it aired that it was only going to be five. So they just basically just chopped it off in the middle. Uh, it's, it's, there's a lot more story to tell here. I'm hoping maybe Taki Odom, who was the uh, other producer-director, might pick it up. But if they don't, I hope somebody else will and that they'll tell the rest of the story. Hmm. What? Okay. So, what's what is life like for Vic Fazell now? Like, what's um, what are you up to now? And um, how's how's this all all affected you? Well, I enjoyed watching the documentary. I really did. Uh, I was disappointed that it didn't go further. But as far as the effect on my daily life, it's gotten us uh, more listeners for the podcast. I mean, we have worldwide listeners. We have. We're surprised at how many listeners we have in Japan. We figured out Henry Lucas is like a cult hero in Japan. So we do our podcast. Jonathan and I put out one or two episodes a week. And the rest of the time, I practice law, man. I'm, I'm almost 69 years old, and I still come to the office every day. I'm still trying lawsuits. I'm still managing my office here in Waco, and I have one in Austin. Uh, we mainly do personal injury and a little bit of... Uh, of criminal defense. 
Uh, we'll only take ten criminal cases at a time because they're they're time consuming, and I don't like to lose, and I really work them. Uh, so we'll only take ten of those. Now I got to say, if I had ten cases and somebody walked in with a check for a hundred grand, I'd probably say, okay, we'll take eleven. But uh, short, it's <laughs> just ten. So yeah, yeah well, you've got you've got millions anyway. So yeah, that's what everybody thinks. No, I pay my bills just like everybody else. Now they uh, they they took it away from me. But yeah, I'm so glad I did it. Uh, that that phone call from Rita Salazar's sister last month made it worthwhile. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, Vic, um, so how do people get a hold of you, or if they have, um, if they need some money and they want to contact you, how do they do this? Uh, best way right now is through our website, uh, vicfazel.com. That's the website for the podcast. Now, if you want to hire us as a lawyer, just Google Vic Fazell Attorney, and I've got all kinds of stuff there. But we used to have a, we- a uh, email address for our uh, for people to contact us about the podcast. But we got hacked. Now, I don't know if that's the deep state or if that's just the Chinese or what, but we got hacked, and our email's not working, and they can't get it fixed. And our, Even our law, Waco law office dropped off of Google Maps two weeks ago, and they can't get us back. And our cloud server was hacked, too, for our law office, and we went six weeks without uh, any email or even access to our documents. I don't know if that's just a whole bunch of coincidence or if there's somebody still trying to get even with me. But we're going to keep marching forward, and we're going to keep doing our podcast. We keep dissecting these Lucas confessions. Uh, We've done quite a few of them. We've got several more we want to look at. Uh, But mainly we're getting into the deep state tactics right now because we've got file boxes just full of stuff, affidavits, sworn testimony, and things that they did to me and tried to do to me that people just are going to find hard to believe. That's why we have the website where we post the, our supporting documents and supporting videos. It's not just my opinion. I don't say anything that I can't absolutely prove. Wow. Well, we're going to have that. Um, we, we'll actually post your uh, um, podcast site to ours so that people can uh, have a link to it, listening to it. They can just do one click and uh, get to it um, as long as it's up. That's so great. Thank you. It's the Vic Fazell Show. And, uh... To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. <laughs> The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.